Hi, I'm Allie Hamilton, and I'm so happy to welcome you to the Come As You Are podcast. Every week, we'll be talking about some aspect of healing, usually around childhood wounds and complicated familial relationships. The topics will always coincide with my personal essay of the week, and this will be a place where we can take a deep dive together. I'm so thrilled you've joined me and delighted for you to always come as you are. Hi there. Hi there. Welcome to our talk today. The topic is Never Waver, the Tricky Rules of Engagement. And this talk is all about communication and particularly communication with the people who really make it the hardest to communicate with. You may have some of those people in your life, and I certainly have in my own in my own life. The person that it was probably the hardest for me to communicate with was my mom. And the reason that it was so difficult to communicate is my mom was an alcoholic, um, but she adamantly refused to acknowledge that reality and in fact worked really hard to deny that reality. So um, when I was a kid, you know, I was seeing all these things and not really understanding how the alcohol was changing her behavior and affecting her personality and the things that she was doing and saying. But as I got older, I started to understand the connection between those two things. You know, when you're a little kid, you don't, of course, think to yourself, oh, it's the alcohol. It doesn't occur to you. Um, but as I got older and did know, I started trying to have those conversations with her and with the other close people in her life. And she was just absolutely unwilling to talk about any of that, you know, to, to acknowledge there was an issue. Um, and then she had, and this is a really common thing with alcoholics, they'll surround themselves with other alcoholics so they can drink together and enablers, people who are going to make the behavior acceptable or okay. And I was pretty much the lone voice in the situation, kind of throwing up a flag and saying, this doesn't seem right. And my mother and everyone around her would say, it's you, you know, it's your perception that's the problem. It's not, it's not your mother and her drinking. It's your perception that, you know, she's drinking too much or it's like, this is you and you're overly sensitive. And um, they called me Sarah Bernhardt. So I had all these sort of like labels and confusion as I was growing up and trying to figure out, is it me or is, um, or am I right? And as I did, you know, become a teenager and understand how alcohol affects you, I was no longer confused about what was happening, but I was confused about how to deal with her, like how to talk to her, how to maneuver around this giant, you know, monster of her alcoholism that was in the room with us and coloring really everything and she just wasn't gonna you know address that or be accountable or have those kinds of conversations so she was the toughest my dad was a close second um, and the reason I'm sharing this with you is just in case you know you might love an addict you might have an addict in your life um, but you also might be dealing with people who have maybe a personality disorder that makes it hard to feel empathy um, and I'm not you know I'm not gonna I, I am not qualified to diagnose that I'm not a therapist but certainly I think we all know people who are on the spectrum somewhere with their own behavior it just makes it really difficult for them to put themselves in your shoes or to if you've got people in your life who can never be wrong who can never say they're sorry who, um, if you have any kind of conflict, are just like absolutely unable to have a reasonable conversation or, you know, no one is right all the time. (laughs) You can trust that. Like no one of us is getting everything right in every moment. We're all human. We're all fallible. And, you know, no one is operating from their highest selves every moment of the day. So if you're dealing with someone in your life who's just never wrong or never willing to say, you know what, I blew that one and I'm really sorry, you're dealing with someone who's got, you know, something going on there. You can trust in that. 
Um, and so I think we all have people like this in our lives. And then there are people who are really so attached to a narrative about themselves or about you or about the situation or about the world at large, it makes it really hard to have meaningful exchanges when conflict arises. Conflict is always going to arise. If you are in any kind of long-term relationship, close relationship with anyone, eventually there's going to be conflict. And, you know, being able to work through that is what allows for real intimacy to develop and trust. Knowing that you are in a relationship with someone who can have the hard conversations, who can hear you when you are confused, you know, not necessarily agree with your take on everything, but who can at least get into um, the ring with you, you know, and kind of like, work it out and and when I say get in the ring that sounds really it doesn't have to be like that it doesn't have to be a fight but that somebody's willing to at least get on the bridge with you let's say that and walk toward you and try to like work through the confusion that may arise or the the hurt feelings and sometimes we're bringing our own stuff into a situation and we're misinterpreting or we're taking something personally or we're misreading someone and you know, you want to be able to have that kind of conversation like, hey, this thing that happened or this thing that you said or did really, it didn't sit right or it just, it really shut me down or it confused me or it just made me feel small or it made me feel unseen or, you know, misunderstood or prejudged or like whatever, you know, you want to be able to talk about that and know that the person can meet you there and and at least hear you, right? And listen with the intention of understanding you and then working through it together so that even if they don't agree necessarily they understand this type of thing is is you know confusing for you and so maybe they can pay attention to that moving forward I certainly have people in my life and I know what their triggers are I know what their history is I love them and so while I might not always you know um agree or I'm gonna I'm it, it's worth it to me to be sensitive you know and to think about this person and what they need and their their past experiences and why they might feel the way that they do and why certain things might feel triggering and then try not to you know not to do that because that's part of loving someone and it doesn't I'm not talking about walking on eggshells or making concessions that are going against your core beliefs or coddling someone or enabling I'm not talking about that but I am talking about making an effort to really understand where someone else is coming from um, and then trying to work with that so there are certain people and you may have these people in your life most of us do it's you're not going to be able to have that kind of interaction with them and so I was writing a lot about that in the personal essay this week which was called never waver the tricky rules of engagement and um waver was spelled w-a-i-v-e-r because I was talking about uh when I wrote yoga's healing power back in 2016 I had to get a waiver my the publisher required a waiver from both of my parents to avoid like lawsuits right they didn't want to get sued for slander libel and so I had to send the manuscript to both of my parents and get them to sign off on it and you know I was writing about how this wasn't it wasn't exactly the book that I wanted to write what I wanted to write was a memoir but I don't think I could have really written the book that I wanted to write then. And I don't think I could have written the book that I'm currently writing while my parents were alive because it was so deeply ingrained in me to, you know, we don't talk about this. (laughs) Like my mom is a big part of her thing was, you know, we don't air our dirty laundry and there was no problem to be talked about. She wasn't an alcoholic, so there wasn't any, there wasn't any issue to solve or, you know. Um, and with my dad, he was equally difficult to talk to about things that had happened. And a lot of things happened in my childhood around my dad and his behavior toward women that he, for whatever reasons, 
um, gave me like a front row seat for that stuff when I was tiny and really entangled me in um, it's kind of like pathology you know like he really did not have a healthy relationship with women and I did not need a front row seat to that but unfortunately I, I got one and I couldn't I tried you know there were many times in my 20s and I think for most people that's usually when you start to try to grapple with whatever your childhood issues might have been whatever happened or didn't happen it's usually going to come to the surface in your 20s when you head out into the world and you start having your own adult relationships whether they're friendships or romantic relationships or you know even professional relationships with your colleagues whatever your tendencies are are going to come to the surface usually then and I did try with my mom I tried a number of times to enter into like a therapeutic process with her and she just couldn't she wasn't going to do that um because she was never wrong and she did not have a problem (laughs) so it's really you know you're not going to have successful therapy with someone who's walking in to the room that way and so it would never last like we'd maybe get I think the maximum number of consecutive sessions we ever had was three and then she was just like I'm out so um so that didn't go anywhere and trying to you know I tried so many different ways to get her to recognize that she was an alcoholic and she just would not she just wouldn't entertain that wouldn't entertain that conversation at all and so that was fruitless and with my dad I did try a few times to say to him like what was happening like when I what what happened there you know like you guys got divorced and I was four and you instantly moved in with the woman who eventually became my stepmom but like why were you taking me with you on all of these dates and extracurricular, you know, activities that you were having with multiple, multiple women? Like, why did you think it was okay to talk to me about that or bring me with you on these dates or involve me in lying to my stepmom? Like, what was going on with you? And he, his response to that was always, wow, you know, this is like, it feels like another lifetime. Like, I don't even remember this stuff. And, um, you know, he would sort of try to put it in this context of you were, you know, you were such a, um, a special kid and you were so mature and such an old soul and, you know, so easy to talk to. It was like, no, I was four. <laughs> I was five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Like, the reason I might have seemed like an old soul is because you were putting all of these extremely grown up problems and issues in my lap. So, you know, just trying to grapple with that stuff. And um, I remember the feeling of just being so overwhelmed and so scared because he would like cry in my arms and I didn't know how to help him or, you know, and I was, again, I was tiny. So I'm listening to his version of what's happening and the way it's being presented to me is that he can't commit and he needs to be free and you know all these women won't share him and I'm thinking these awful women just why can't they just share my dad you know um it took me also till I got to be like 12 13 before I realized wait a second you know he's not the victim of this situation he's the perpetrator but when I would try to like have those conversations with him he was unavailable for that he just wouldn't he would tell me he didn't remember and um, or it seemed like another lifetime Um, or he would try to skew it and make it like it was somehow some kind of you know testament to what a special kid I was and it's like no (laughs) none of that it works and none of that is helpful and he just wouldn't engage in that conversation in any meaningful way where I you know where I felt like okay he has a lot of regret or he understands what he did and why that was really not good for me and the trouble that it caused and all the stuff I sort of had to unravel and figure out later none of that occurred and you might have people I think for my dad he Um, was a very charismatic person I think he was he could be a good listener um, very creative person non-judgmental 
but also like definitely wrapped up in himself and you know I think he was somewhere on the narcissism spectrum he just couldn't really understand the impact of a lot of his behavior on the people around him couldn't understand why my stepmom would be in the bathroom sobbing all night uh, if a woman called the house you know couldn't understand later why I was enraged as a teenager and a young adult like couldn't really wasn't willing to kind of take that on and always made himself the victim of other people's you know if somebody was really upset especially a woman you know he was the victim of that my mother had all this rage toward him that I didn't understand as a little kid but you know when I got older I realized he had cheated on her like multiple times starting when like when she was seven months pregnant with me so of course she was enraged but the way he presented it to me was he was the victim of my mother's you know um unjustified rage and it's like no it's justified friend <laughs> like it's very justified and so that you know these are my examples from my life you may have your own examples I'm gonna imagine that you do because as you go through life no matter what you know you may have family members who are either struggling with addiction or struggling with accountability for any number of reasons nobody listen nobody likes to be caught out you know quote unquote like that's not when you realize you have not shown up in a you know in a sensitive way or you have been thoughtless or you have blown an opportunity to you know be your best self that feels terrible like nobody likes that feeling of getting it wrong or blowing it or you know making a mistake and being called out but part of like being an accountable person and building your own character and like being able to look yourself in the eye at the end of the day when you're brushing your teeth is you know being able to own that stuff and being able to say oh I really did blow that and I'm really sorry like I get why you feel the way that you do and um, I'm going to really think about what happened here and why I said what I did or did what I did so that I can make different choices next time or better choices or so that you can say, you know, I don't really, help me understand more why this was upsetting for you. I don't really get it. Like, you know, help me know you better. You know, like anything like that is what is going to enable meaningful communication. It's going to help all of us feel heard and understood and seen and cherished by the close people in our lives. Not everyone's going to be able to do that for you or for me. And so when you're talking about there are certain people that, um, you know, might really struggle with empathy and accountability and might never be wrong and might never be able to say they're sorry, um, might have to cast you as the villain in every interaction um, or the, the cause, you know, of whatever thing has gone wrong you might have people in your life who have a, like a whole narrative about all of that or stories that they tell themselves and I'm talking about things like um, I never get the breaks or everybody's out to get me or you can't trust anyone like there are a lot of people in this world walking around with stories that are probably not helping them and are not true but you know this is like how they're coping and everybody's got their coping mechanisms and their things, right? Their histories, times they've been hurt, heartbroken, let down. Um, and that includes us. And so it's really good to be able to look at your stories and look at the narratives that you have about things that have happened. Not everybody's going to be able to do that. You know, like I, I had that. Certainly coming out of my childhood, I thought you can't trust anyone. You certainly can't trust men. Um, everyone leaves. Everyone cheats. Like these are things that I really thought. I also thought that my value as a human being was tied up in what I was able to do for other people or how much I could help or how much I could be like a chameleon and just be exactly what someone needed in order to not get left. I mean, a lot of narratives that I had to really – look at and um and unravel so that they weren't ruling my life or my decision making processes you know I had to like really look at that stuff um and we all have that but not everybody's like willing or able to to look at those things 
And my mother, I remember like so many times in my life, uh, with my dad, I kind of gave up at a certain point. I think in my 20s, I realized he's never going to own anything. Like he's never going to, um, you know, recognize what he did and apologize for it. Like that's just not going to happen. It's not in the cards. And there were so many other things too. As I got older, you know, he would like like it if we walked down the street when I was a teenager and other men thought we were a couple. Like that's disgusting, you know. And I just realized like he's never going to he's never going to see how disgusting that is. Like he was still doing that when I was in my 30s, you know, and after I had my son, like he was still, there was a time he came out to visit and I've written about this. And, you know, we went down in an elevator with a young couple who was asking me questions. And um, when we got off the elevator, my dad said, I wonder if they were thinking to themselves, how'd that old coot get that hot young? And I'm like, no, (laughs) no, dad, they weren't thinking that. They were absolutely thinking you are the grandpa. It's like obvious and also disgusting that you would want anybody to think anything else. So I just, I knew there's like, this is a person that isn't going to be able to grasp this and change it or apologize for it. This is this someone that I'm going to decide, can I have this person in my life or not? And if I'm having them in my life, like to what extent, to what degree, and how am I keeping myself safe and sane? And with him, it was pretty easy because he moved to North Carolina. You know, I grew up, I was born and I grew up in New York City. My dad moved to North Carolina when I was 20. And that's where he lived for decades with his fourth wife, who happened to be his high school sweetheart. Um, And, you know, I, it was pretty, I saw him like once a year. I would talk to him on the phone, I don't know, like every couple months. Um, so it was easy to keep him at a distance and just deal with it when he would come to visit. It was highly stressful for me when he would come to visit because I would know that he was going to do something inappropriate and, you know, and that I was going to have to manage my feelings around that. But I wasn't looking for him to change or to get it. I had stopped doing that. Um... You know, this is a man who, I mean, he had, he did have a lot of great qualities as well. I, you know, as, as I said, very creative, very smart, open-minded kind of guy. Started sculpting when he was like 70. Um, I think he might have started in his late 60s, but late in life and was actually like incredibly good at it. And that's another, you know, like he came out and he sculpted me in a yoga pose when I was, I think I was like 29 or 30. And he then made this sculpture and told me he had made the butt a little bit smaller, the boobs a little bit bigger, and the hair a little bit longer. And it's like, dude, (laughs) dad, dude, like how do you not know? You just should not say that to me. That's so outrageously rude and awful and hurtful and like gross you know this is the guy's not going to get it so um I stopped I was able to stop looking for him to get it you know for him to see the light or have some major epiphany and become like a great dad like I just knew it wasn't going to happen so I think I stopped making myself you know crazy trying to get him to change and what I did instead was just manage my feelings around having this person as my dad which was hard you know it was hard he was not it it was not easy being his daughter and my half sister and I we bonded really late in in life um and really just the last three years of her life and but we had a lot of great conversations because she certainly related and um you know he just he just wasn't it just wasn't going to happen he never did have that he never did have that epiphany um although i did manage to explain to him his flash rage was unacceptable around my children at any time ever in any way And so he did manage to not lose his temper around my kids. 
Um, but that is the only concession. That is the only, you know, behavioral change I was able to demand and receive. And other than that, no. So um, that is kind of like where you, you, you need to get with people like this. You either need to decide, I don't want this person in my life because they're never going to get it and they're going to keep crossing boundaries. And the cost, the emotional cost to me is too great to make it worthwhile to stay in this relationship. And I did have times in my life, well, one time where I just stopped speaking to him because I was like, all right, let me try that. <laughs> and I was in my mid-20s. But the sort of emotional cost of not speaking to him was greater than the cost of speaking to him and managing my feelings when he would do or say something that was just, you know, outrageous. That's, that's how it felt for me. And so, um, but you might decide there may be people in your life, you know, for me, it's like, I think always it's been a last resort to cut people off, but I have cut some people off because I just have had to for my own well being. Um, and you may have people like that as well. Certainly these are not the people who are going to be in your inner circle. They're just not because they're not going to be able to be kind and respectful and do the bare minimum necessary to have a meaningful relationship and healthy communication. They're not up to it. Either they can't do it or they won't do it. And you, you know, you can, that one of the things I really wanted to touch on today is that this is not personal. It feels personal. It feels like you're not worth it to them to change. That's a very human way to feel about interactions with people like this. I'm not worth it. Like, um, and I'm going to switch to my mom for a second because if you love an addict, you know, it might help to just really highlight this. I remember feeling like her commitment to Chardonnay and to drinking is more important to her than I am. You know, the Chardonnay is more important. The drinking is more important. It's not that. When you're talking about an addict, you know, addiction takes people hostage. It's a thief. And you're not, it's not a question for an addict of, okay, what's more important to me, the substance or this person? You're just not even in the equation. They need the substance. That's what they've decided. I need the substance to survive. I can't do life without it. So it's not about what's more important. It's like, I need to live, so this is what I need to do. And, you know, that's, those are like, it's not real, right? From the outside, you're like, well, if you stop drinking, everything in your life would get so much better. But to somebody who's in the grip of addiction, it, that is not their reality. And so um, a huge part of keeping yourself sane is not taking it personally and it is so hard to do and so you know believe me I'm talking about my mom and my dad <laughs> like there are not people who are you, you know everything feels that much more personal when you're talking about your own parents and how they're treating you it's really hard not to take it personally or not to feel like it's a reflection of something broken in you and that's what I thought growing up I thought my mother doesn't love me because I'm broken inside. Like at my core, I must be deeply unlovable. No, you know, most people can't see it, but my mother can see it. And, um, and it, it was devastating. You know, it really did a number on my self-esteem and just my self-worth and the way I thought of myself in the world and the things I thought I needed to do in order to earn love and in order to not be left you know, it really, um, it had such a huge impact on all of my relationships and just the way that I was in the world and the way that I showed up in different situations. And that was something I really had to grapple with as I became an adult. I had to really unravel my story from that story. And boundaries are your number one friend in a situation like this, in relationships like this. Understand, you know, first of all, for me, because it was my mother and I was so entangled in that whole situation with her and the drinking and the denial, the, the just the absolute passionate denial 
that there was a problem um, and the crazy making gaslighting environment that you're growing up in where you're literally seeing things with your own eyes and this rage is coming at you and this person is literally like transforming in front of your eyes from your gorgeous mother to this like wild twisted scary beast coming at you you know as a tiny kid um and everyone around you is saying there's nothing wrong you know it's really you're like okay like is it me or is it everyone else so self-trust is like a huge thing and for me the boundaries were the first thing and that's the first thing for anyone trying to navigate a path with someone who is just so unwilling to um, engage in a reasonable conversation or healthy communication. They either can't engage or they won't engage. So I had to physically remove myself. I moved 3,000 miles away. And that also helped, just like it had with my dad when he moved to North Carolina. It helped with my mom when I took myself out of that environment and moved to the other side of the country it gave us the space and it gave me the space to figure out who am I? <laughs> like, let me reroute myself over here and figure out who I am separate from my mother and her drinking and all the ways that I'm moving toward her and away from her. And um, that is, you know, that was sort of like boundary number one. And then there were emotional boundaries. And that's a key thing too. So if you are, if you're going to, and I didn't want to cut my mother out of my life, like ever. I loved my mother. That's the, that's the key part of the story is that I loved her with everything I had, you know, and all I wanted was for her to love me. And I know as a grown woman, she did love me, you know, she did, but I just, I didn't have the um, frame of reference and the understanding to realize that when I was little and as I was growing up in that environment and so um you know I, I know that now but figuring out what you need in order to be okay in the context of a relationship like this is is key it's essential and for me what I needed is a, first a geographical boundary and then a bunch of emotional boundaries and what that looked like for me was like okay I don't want to speak to her when she's drinking and so I have to think about the time difference and you know it's three hours earlier in Los Angeles than it is in New York and so what time of day is it when I can talk to her before because she would start drinking depending on her day you know five six and so I was always doing the math there's a lot of math involved in my relationship with her um I was always doing sort of the math on both sides of the equation when she would visit she would come to LA or I would go home to New York I would always know there was you know probably going to be at least one night where she got falling down drunk and I would have to manage that you know and figure that out and so I always needed an escape route or a plan B you know a backup plan um, somewhere safe I could go remove myself from the situation or have a rental car or um, eventually when she would visit me out here I would get her a hotel room because I had learned the hard way that giving her you know my room in the house with the kids like I didn't want them to see grandma like that you know I just they loved her she loved them she was a really good grandma like I didn't want them to see the drinking as they got older there were times that they did see it you know um, unfortunately but not in the house it wasn't up in their faces it wasn't in a they were never in a situation where they couldn't escape from it that never happened um, but that is because I was carefully managing and orchestrating and handling things and you know that's that's kind of the cost of being in a relationship with someone who will not meet you on that bridge or in that field I was talking about sort of this like the idea of you know meeting people on the field where love can grow right and how that field doesn't have eggshells you know you're not tiptoeing around trying not to like you know set off a landmine you don't have to worry about that 
on, on a field where love can occur and trust can occur and healthy communication can occur, mistakes are allowed. Um, you don't have to watch every single word. You don't have to, you know, be, be perfect. Like, it's like, that's not reasonable. No one can do that. And if that's what's being required of you, like, this is not going to be a situation where you can really be close to someone. And so if that's the case, if you have to have people like this in your life for some reason or another, and you know, there are complicated situations in life sometimes where you have to have someone in your life, but it isn't easy. Um, you've got to figure out how to manage and how to keep yourself sane. And I was talking about not going to the hardware store for apples, which is the, the I heard that phrase in an Al-Anon meeting. And Al-Anon is for family members of alcoholics. And I went for about three years when I was 17 to 20 um, because I was, you know, I was just, I was so, I was still living in New York City and um, trying to figure out how to navigate this situation with my mom. And I went to an Al-Anon meeting and it was like, oh, wow, I just found the room with like all the people from the planet that I'm from, you know, there's all these people dealing with just like codependency and um, caretaking and gaslighting and second guessing themselves and doing too much. And, you know, I was like, oh, oh, okay, (laughs) this is really helpful. But I only went for a few years because I didn't, at a certain point, I'm like, I don't want my mother's alcoholism to define my entire identity. Like, I'm not just the child of an alcoholic. There's more to me than that. And that is why I removed myself from the situation and then figured out how to navigate the relationship with her and maneuver and manage. Um, And that's not ideal. You don't want to be managing, maneuvering, you know, like that's not like that's not a healthy scenario but sometimes it's the only one that's available short of just cutting the person out of your life so these are choices um or they're not or you're in a situation where you have someone in your life and it can it could be you know just for example like um you know if you have if divorce and children in the situation sometimes that becomes really acrimonious and difficult or if you are in a work environment and you're dealing with a boss or someone you know who is who has power over your situation and you need the job and you need the benefits in order to be okay you know you may be dealing with people like this in your life or you might have someone in your extended family that you're going to see at weddings and really not want to sit next to because they've got a list of ways everyone in the family has wronged them that goes back to like you know 1962 you know it's like there are you're probably going to encounter these people and they're very attached to their version of what has happened they're i mean very attached you know passionately attached to it um they're attached to a narrative about themselves and about other people and about why things are the way they are and why they feel the way they feel and why they're right and why you are wrong and why anyone else who disagrees with them is wrong. And, you know, I mean, and I'm sure that you have had these experiences or people who are, you know, I worked at a yoga studio once and the person who owned the studio, this was years ago when I first moved to Los Angeles, I mean, just one day would be my best friend and the next day would be just like awful to me. And I didn't want to lose the job because I loved my students, you know, and I was just building something when I had first moved here. So sometimes you find yourself in a situation, the only thing you can do is not take it personally because it's not you. This is like how this person is getting through. And they're getting through by telling themselves a story about who they are and who everybody else is. And you're not going to change that. Um, Or you're in a a, familial situation with someone. You don't want to cut them out of your life. Or you're in another personal situation where you have to have this person in your life. It's not personal. This is like their coping mechanism. They They may have an outward facade for the world, you know that they are very attached to, it's not just for the world. It's also for themselves. It's how they can live with themselves. It's how they can go to sleep at night. 
this is what they have to tell themselves in order to be okay, you're not going to change that. And that is what I was really writing about this week is like, I spent so much time with my mom, but not just my mom, other people like this as well, where I would think, well, if I just say this in exactly the right way, if I, if I write the perfect email with all of these really concrete examples, or I write the exact right text, or I prepare myself to have this face-to-face conversation in just the right way, then I'm going to get through and they're going to get it. You know, they're going to see the light. Um, no, (laughs) no, they're not. They're not, they're not like, and you can spin for days, weeks, months, years, trying to get someone like this to see the light and all you're doing is exhausting yourself and if you keep getting in the ring with someone like this it's like going to become more and more painful my mom used to go for the jugular like I had to learn I can't confide in her ever even when things are good between us I can't forget what I'm dealing with because if I confide in her right now when we're laughing together and we're having a great time it's only a matter of time before she gets angry and she takes this thing that I confided in her and she uses it against me and that was one of the most painful experiences that I remember um, in dealing with her you know is that the absolute betrayal of not just my mom, you know, going after my jugular and using something I had shared with her in a moment of vulnerability against me when it served her rage, but also the fact that I had betrayed myself by forgetting that I couldn't do that with her, you know. And betraying yourself, I think, is like the worst of all betrayals when you know. And, it, and sometimes you're just human, you know, and it's your, like for me, it's like my mom, of course I want to confide in my mom and I want to talk to her about the real things happening in my life or the hard things happening in my life. I did the single mom thing for eight years with two little kids while I was running a business and like working. And I mean, it was exhausting and scary and, you know, just really hard and she had been a single mom like I wanted to talk to her and I wanted to lean on her but I couldn't and I learned that over and over again the very hard and painful way and what I was talking about and that's an extreme example because it was my mom but like anyone like that in your life you have to learn to stop getting in the ring you have to learn to stop trying to write the perfect email or the perfect text or say that like just you've just got to stop thinking things are going to change it's not changing it's there are a lot of therapists who will not cover for example these are just examples um, people who are diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder or borderline personality disorder because it's so difficult to treat most insurance companies will not cover it if that's the diagnosis because it's so difficult to treat and you know I'm not you may be dealing with someone who's on the spectrum of that sort of behavior and not like a diagnosable person with NPD or you might be dealing with you know full-blown case of that only a only a qualified licensed therapist could figure that out psychologists can figure that out or psychiatrists but um, you know there are some markers and the inability to ever be wrong is a huge marker <laughs> if you're dealing with that you know, you're dealing with something and if you're dealing with someone who flies into a rage um, anytime you just try to have sort of a reasonable conversation about something that's you're dealing with something there um, you know there there you can tell like you've been alive on this planet long enough you know what sort of a reasonable situation is with someone when you go to communicate and what a really not reasonable situation is and you can trust that and it isn't personal this is just how this person is getting through but it becomes personal if you keep setting yourself up to have to deal with all of that you know um at a certain point you really do have to grasp I'm not this is not someone who's going to be able to engage with me in any meaningful way 
and I need to stop trying. I need to stop trying and understand the only thing that's going to change is the way I'm interacting with this person. They're not changing. I'm not going to get them to see the light. The only thing I can do is change the way I'm interacting. And if you're talking about someone that you have to have in your life, like you recognize this, you know that no meaningful communication is going to happen, but you, you know, you have to have them in your life, then your best possible bet is to um, communicate as though you are talking to a business acquaintance. You know, it's a professional interaction. It's emotionless as best as possible. It's factual. Here are the facts and here are the fewest amount of words I can use (laughs) to get the facts across and leave your emotion out of it. Is it so hard? Yeah, it's really hard. It's a giant lesson in self-restraint, but it's also a giant lesson in, you know, self-care because you're You're just going to keep setting yourself up for pain otherwise. And then it is you. It's not them anymore. You know, if you keep going to the hardware store for apples, if you keep thinking you're going to get through to them this time, you're, it's you. You need to take, you need to step back and look at your behavior. It's the only thing you're going to be able to change in this situation. And um, it's not personal. It's not your fault. It's not about anything lacking in you. It's this other person who cannot do it, you know, who can't be wrong ever. Um, You know, got to just recognize that, see it for what it is, and behave accordingly. Shift the way that you're interacting accordingly and save your genuine, open, human, vulnerable conversations and communication for people who can meet you there on that other field that I was talking about, you know, who are who know how to say they're sorry, who know how to admit when they're wrong, who know how to listen, who allow you to get things wrong, who know how to forgive. I really do think being able to give and receive apologies is a huge part of like, you know, evolving as a human being. Let me give people the grace to be imperfect and let me give myself the space also to be imperfect and let us like all be a little bit kinder and gentler with each other because it's just hard being human you know we're on a spinning planet in one solar system in a vast universe we have a just a blink of time we're highly vulnerable we're in a you know crazy world violent world you know like it's a lot and so you really do want to gravitate toward people who understand that and who can meet you with kindness and with compassion and with the ability to communicate like a reasonable adult, you know, like a, just a person who gets life and understands we're not getting everything right every minute and that it's okay. Like it's really okay. And the other people who can't do that with you, they don't, they're not coming to, you're not inviting them onto the field. They're, they don't get an invitation from you to get on the field because you already know they can't, they're not going to do it. So don't, you know, don't open the door to your beautiful field like just it's sad it's too bad they can't come and have a seat and sit in the sun and you know have a laugh and dig their toes in the grass but like they can't do it so you know they don't get to meet you there they get to meet you like on the cold hard concrete where you're gonna have a really just factual exchange of information (laughs) and that's where that's staying and and, you know and I mean maybe I, I always kept the door open. Um, I always had a sliver. It's not like I ever lost hope with my mom. With my dad, I did. I just gave up on that and just said, okay, I'm just going to accept this person for who he is and not expect it to change. And I'm going to manage this relationship as best I can. And I did. And I did it all the way. I saw him all the way out. I walked him home. Um, But with my mom, I never gave up hope because she and I had something you know, like real, and like there was love there, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of love flowing in both directions, but just a lot of stuff in the way, and so I never fully lost hope, but I did 
protect myself. And I'll tell you that we did get there on her deathbed. The last two, three weeks of her life were the closest that we ever were because she finally understood that the whole problem between us had been her drinking and her rage and it all dissipated you know she just there just wasn't anything left there except the love and it was just so healing and you know something I'm so grateful for Um, and I wish that for everyone who's in a relationship with someone close in their lives like I wish that healing for everyone because it's really painful I'm talking about these things like it's you know um, believe me that when I'm saying this to you about not inviting those people onto your field you know your beautiful field where the love is growing I know how heartbreaking it is what I'm saying like I do I know from having done it for so many years but it's what you have to do to keep yourself safe and sane and keeping yourself safe and sane has to come before everything else You know, you have a beautiful heart, you have a beautiful mind, you've been through all these things in your life, you have great gifts and wisdom and humor and insight to share that only you can because only you have your particular perspective. You're not going to be able to do those things to the best of your ability if you are exhausted from doing too many rounds in the ring with people who are just going to go for your jugular over and over, you know, and just suck the lifeblood out of you. Um... So got to make, you got to make those really hard but essential choices. I, I hope this is helpful. Um, I'm always open for more conversation about any of this. And I'm, you know, I try to be easy to find. And I'm sending you lots of love. Thank you for joining me for this talk. Until next time. Mm-hmm.